Um, I am delighted to welcome my friend Victoria Riddell to join us. I've always wanted Victoria to be part of the Toto Santos Writers Workshop, but she very sensibly has a teaching job in the real world at Sarah Lawrence, so she never could come. So that this was sort of a blessing in disguise that I could I could bring her here uh, to talk with all of us. Um, Victoria is both a poet and a novelist. She has three collections of poems and she's written five novels. Um, she's a recipient of fellowship from the Guggenheim. She's got an NEA grant and um, many other awards. Her work has been widely translated and she has um, basically uh, shown us what it's like to have a literary community during the pandemic um, through her Instagram account, which is at Victoria Writer, where she has been posting regularly. Um, it was daily for a while, now it's gonna be weekly. Um, brief introductions to a different writer each time, and then she'll read a bit of their work and really the insight that she brings to the writer's work and that she can share with all of us makes us feel like the literary community is still intact, even though we're all very spread apart from each other. Uh, Victoria is gonna talk tonight about uh, using real life events in her fiction. And so I just wanna say something about her most recent work of fiction, which I just adore called Before Everything. Um, it's been compared to Virginia Woolf's The Waves, and it really is an ode to female friendship and to any of us who have been part of a tight friendship unit that has grown up together, uh, the resonance is palpable and it stays with you long after you read it. So Victoria, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And all of you, please, those of you in the workshop, same as we did the other night. When you have questions, put them in the chat box. I will monitor it and ask Victoria at the end, but put them in as they occur to you. If it becomes relevant to what she's talking about, I'll just bounce it in there. Welcome, Victoria. Am I off mute? Am I, can you hear me? Okay, great. Oh, right, you went mute. <laughs> um, hi, hi everyone. Um, let me just put it on a group thing so I can see all of your faces for a little bit. Hi, hi. Um, hi, Joy. Joy, I know. I, I want to go to that restaurant. Don't you all wish we were just, I wish I was having this conversation with you guys just sitting in the restaurant. I want that fish. I want the whole shebang. Um, but here we are. And um, I've got a glass of water instead of I think, you know, a margarita or something completely great. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, um, about the, dis talk about how I've um, managed my way into using both elements of um, my life, the life of people around me, as well as um, history inside of books and sort of the choices, the ethical questions, um, things that come up. And um, I, you know, it's a funny thing to talk about oneself for 40 minutes. So let me just say that right away. It's a much easier thing if I were gonna be talking about the work of another writer and how I think they manage that act. Um, so I apologize for, rambling on about myself and my work for 40 minutes, but that's what I'm here to do. So I came to fiction, um, to a life in fiction at all, first through a life in poetry. And um, while I'd written certainly um, persona poems, I'd written poems in the voice of Emma Goldman, I'd written poems in the voice of Hagar from the Bible. Um, inside of poetry, uh, the sense of the speaker felt like an alter me or like a kind of sort of me. Like it, we weren't really, I wasn't really saying it was all of me all the time, but I wasn't really having a problem thinking I was writing out of my experience. Um, 
And so that even in, in a more recent collection of poems, poems titled Circe or poems titled Persephone, um, felt like the speaker was me um, when I wrote uh, poems that included um, my kids. They were really pretty close to my kids. Uh, in fiction, somehow when I moved into fiction, there was like a big no inside of me about that. And um, in, in fact, if I, if I think like about it looking back, I was thinking um, that really the first story I tried to write, which was um, in high school, the first time I really thought I'd written a story, my central character was a uh, kind of prepubescent girl living in Tennessee. Not only had I never been to Tennessee, but maybe the only Southern state I'd been in was Florida. Um, so I, 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 I was really completely full of shit. And yet the character was a girl. So I knew something about being a girl. I knew something about being pubescent, um, but it didn't get any better when I started thinking I was gonna try to write some fiction. And the first stories I wrote, um, the, they were taking place in Durango, Colorado, a place I had actually been to, um, uh, you know, and I had, the character was kind of a, a, a lady bartender um, and, 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 the, and the people entering the bar had names like Ride and Skid and, and the stories were just horrible. Um, you know, they were two dimensional. I didn't really have a connection to the characters. Um, and I'm not saying that the move then went to write what you know, um, because in many ways, I think that was exactly what I felt I couldn't do. Um, and somehow that hadn't afflicted me inside of poetry, but I grew up in, um, I grew up in a household of uh, uh, immigrant parents. Um, both my parents were refugees and um, from Europe, from the war and, uh, the, the mode in our family was towards full assimilation. Um, so much so that my mother, whose maiden name was Natasha Soltanitsky, um, and she grew up with relatives who had names like Sabina and Rasha, named her three daughters, uh, Victoria, Jessica, and Donna. So it was, you know, we are establishing ourselves um, in America. And somehow to write into my any piece of my family felt like some sort of betrayal of what I was supposed to be doing, which was this act of assimilation. Um, and, uh, and yet it, it, it kept pushing me. And um, I, at, at some point as I was trying to write, um, and still somehow doggedly trying to write stories, um, the sentence came into my head, we were Russia. And uh, when I wrote it, I had a moment of feeling like, oh, I, I, I'm gonna do that. I, I think I'm ready to go there. And what was funny was to me was that after I wrote that and, and started working on that story, I saw that in writing notebooks of mine for years, I'd had a version of that sentence, that, that the move towards um, moving into what was sort of my family's story had been happening for a while. And inside of that story collection, which I'm not gonna talk about for very much time, after I wrote that story um, that starts, we were Russia, we, were not, we weren't only Russia, and it kind of goes towards the, um, the diaspora of my family, which has one grandfather born in Poland and one grandfather born in Egypt. Um, I, 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 I moved into feeling excited about um, how much I actually could bring in actual fact and then fiction. And so I would screw with it all the time in that first story collection. And, and, it, and it got me into the first set of kind of problems that I experienced, which were familial. And I think that that's one of the sort of topics in this, which is when you in fiction move into work, I guess it's the same kinds of questions that come up in memoir. When you move into narratives that engage parts of the family, 
um, you, you or, or other people, you begin to kind of maybe raise the ire of those people. So the first story in that story collection, um, uh, not the first one I wrote, but the first one that's in it, uh, is a story um, uh, called Where the Road Bottoms Out, which is the co title collection of that story collection. And it's um, it, in the story, a, a girl has a mother who has been sick and she um, it's an exploration of, of a daughter's kind of anger at, um, at a mother's illness and a, and a kind of her own appetite for being alive in the face of her mother's illness. I indeed had a mother who, when I was 19, um, became ill and by the time I was 23 when I was long the uh, I was writing these after I was 23 my mother had passed away and the story um, takes place on the streets I grew up in the neighbors are the names of my neighbors um, I I never took my mother on the walk that the girl takes her mother on um, the girl is sort of flagrantly when she's not walking her mother kind of boot camp style brutally to kind of make her well. Uh, she's running around um, uh, sort of with this uh, wild appetite for being alive primarily sexually inside of the story. That was not sort of what my life actually looked like during this time, but it was what was happening in the fiction. And yet placing it right in the middle of um, a story in which the streets were the names of the streets, um, the shared wall between my bedroom and my parents' bedroom appears in the first paragraph of it. Um, and I didn't really, I was so boldly writing this, having kind of decided I was going to come into work that could be uh, elementally mine, um, that I didn't think about it until I gave the first reading from the book, which my dad was going to come to. And um, I was I thought, oh my God, what have I done? Um, so I, uh, I think at that reading, nothing bad happened because he was so excited to hear his daughter reading that he didn't even hear the story, I don't think. So nothing really happened at that. But then when he started to read the book, it was the first story he was reading. And um, apparently he called up my sister and said, um, you know, that's not mom, she wasn't, you know, he was, he was really upset. And, um, and my sister, you know, God bless her, said, dad, close the book. If you're looking for your version of mom, if you're looking for my version of mom, I think even if you're looking for Victoria's version of mom, you're not gonna find it in this book. She's writing, you know, he, she just did a whole thing for me and then called me right away, you know, best sister fashion. And I immediately called my dad to apologize to him. And I felt terrible. Um, but he had already gone all literary and said, I know, you know, uh, and he was, I don't know who he was pulling out of his mouth, Gertrude Stein, and he was pulling all sorts of writers. Um, and I said, great, dad. And then he happily, you know, gave the book to friends and told them not to worry. So some years later, and um, I uh, was starting to think about a second novel. And in that novel, uh, my, my, dad, <clears throat> my dad and his parents um, left Brussels the morning after the bombing of Brussels um, in 1940, in May of 1940. And their, um, their flight out of Europe, their exodus out of Europe, um, uh, which was kind of amazing, uh, including uh, a, a, a couple of uh, who wound up in Brussels from another town, from the town of Liège, and ran out of gas. And some friends of my father's family let them know that this couple had landed without gas. And my father and his parents said, you know, if you let us ride in the back of your car, um, we will pay for the petrol and wherever we sleep, you'll sleep, whatever we eat, you'll eat. And that's how um, they made their way uh, uh, for six days from Brussels to the border of France. Imagine how clogged with cars 
they were. In any case, um, and that trip continued, Karen, all the way down through the south of France to Perpignan, um, when you meant, which you mentioned before. Um, and then finally onto a ship called the Kwanzaa, which came into uh, New York with many, many more people on it, uh, over 200, 300 people. It was a ship that would normally be a cargo ship to Africa and um, instead was routed as a ship to go into New York and to drop people off um, and then go to Mexico. Um, and uh, my father and his parents and about a hundred other people who were on the ship, a hundred other Jewish people who were on the ship were refused entry into New York and then again refused entry in Mexico. 14 of them were allowed in, in Mexico. And then they were being about to be sent back to, to Europe, um, much like this situation of the St. Louis, which is a ship that more people know about since it returned. Um, so that spine of that journey, I always knew was interesting. I mean, a journey novel is an interesting thing, you know, and to be given that kind of as a family gift is, uh, is, a, is a great gift, I think, for a writer to explore. Um, but I also knew as I was trying to make my way into the opening pages of, of figuring it out that, um, that, that their journey out of Europe and the sort of circumstances weren't enough to make a novel. The novel had to have some other kind of stakes in it that were not just like us against the Germans, you know, coming to get us. That there had to be interpersonal stakes. There had to be something. There had to be a, a conflict inside of the characters, um, and the conflict wasn't just running. Um, I didn't think, and. Um, so I was sort of writing a lot of bad pages for a while um, until I kind of landed and heard, you know, that thing we all want to hear when we're writing, which is the sound of the novel. And that happened again, just not after the 30 really bad pages I had been um, writing. But one day walking down the street, um, I heard sort of in my head, um, the characters say, or a voice say, um, dear Eleanor Roosevelt, do you like stories? And I was like, oh, the boy is writing Eleanor Roosevelt. One of the things I knew was that um, among the few things that my dad left Brussels with, he had just um, put together enough money to buy himself a portable typewriter. Um, you know, it was probably a really heavy thing, what we're calling a portable typewriter then, but it was like a pride and joy. And I knew he had brought it with him. Um, and I suddenly saw this boy writing letters. So I went to my dad. So now I knew enough uh, to think I got to talk to my father about this before I jump in. And I said, dad, I want to write this book or I'm thinking about working my way into this book that uses the spine of your journey. Um, and he, you know, kind of perked up and felt good. And I said, but uh, I need to talk to you about it because I don't know who's going to, I don't know who's going to make it on the ship. Um, on, on the ship, he and his mom and his dad all came safely to America. And um, I didn't know that that if what was going to happen. And I also knew that they came with another family, um, the family that had actually alerted them to the, um, the couple with the car. And uh, that, that, that these two families moved together and managed to move together all the way through, were never separated. Um, but I wasn't sure that that's what was going to happen in this book. And I needed to, I don't know what I needed, but I, what I needed was what I got, which was my father saying, do what you want, do what you want. Um, and then what ensued is something that I would almost wish for everyone, writer or not writer, which was, um, he became a primary source for me. He became a primary piece of research for me. Uh, and so I would meet with my dad and you know how, um, I'm certainly guilty of this now as a parent, but I felt like my father had like three stories he told me over and over. And it was the same friggin' three stories. Um, and uh, now I was asking my father questions that I would have never thought to ask him. Like, did you ever go on a family vacation? Where'd you go? Who was your first girlfriend? Where'd you meet her? 
What was your school uniform like? Um, and then I would watch my dad, who at that point was um, in his 80s, you know, I'd watch, I, you know, what was your school uniform like? And I would watch his face sort of lost to me for a little bit because he would begin to move through time. And, um, and then he'd say, so itchy, you know, so itchy. It was, and, and it was like, I was learning the information and he was re-inhabiting memory. And so it was a blast. You know, he got to remember things that, um, well, maybe he was remembering all the time. He said that he, uh, there were many, many things that mm, these questions, my spending time with him and asking him weird off strange questions um, made possible. However, I was also writing a novel that happened in actual history. So this is sort of my thinking or what I wanna share about this, which is, the choice I made, I mean, there are writers who mess with actual history, right? Who, who begin to ply and bend the questions of real history, right? Um, uh, well, Michael Chabon's novel, right? That sort of messes, there's some of his work that does exactly that. Um, I made a kind of commitment to myself that actual history, so um, Eleanor Roosevelt, played a piece in the saving of, of, of what was the 86 passengers of the Kwanzaa. Um, so anything that happened there, she wasn't gonna, she wasn't gonna behave in ways um, that, that she hadn't. She wasn't gonna do extraordinary things that she didn't do. And she was gonna do exactly what she did do if I was gonna use any of that. Um, the information about the ship, how the ship was actually, uh, where it was positioned um, in Virginia. Uh, all, of the, all of that information, um, when I researched it, my commitment was to stay true to that. And that I could um, screw with my family's history, having been given the blessing of my dad, who was the only member of that family still alive. But of course, I started messing with the other family. And that was a tricky moment because um, the other family um, also came aboard the ship, but uh, I was pretty confident they would not be aboard the ship. I was pretty confident that um, as I was working into the book that probably only this boy eats up potentially his mother, or we weren't gonna be sure whether his mother was or wasn't on the ship for a good piece of the book, um, was the only one who was on the ship. And um, I just kind of held my breath and was doing that. Uh, and then I had um, the weird slam up of, of, of reality, which was, I, I went out one day, it was actually a, a, a really kind of lucky one, it changed the whole book, um, I went out one day uh, to, I had some dining room chairs that were um, falling apart. And there was a, a shop up the street that um, fixed chairs. So I went into the shop and I, I brought another chair in there and I said, I have these chairs, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'd like to fix them. And you fixed another chair. And the guy said, what's your name? And I gave him my name. Um, I didn't think he'd remember. And then there was a woman and she said to me, um, is your last name Riddell? And then she asked me if my father was my father. And I thought she was probably somebody in a, a business with him or, you know, who she knew through, he knew her through business. And uh, she said, I, I don't know if you know uh, this name will mean anything, but I'm Maurice Golden Hart's daughter. So um, I, I kind of sat down in the chair and I said, uh, I don't know how to say this to you, um, but I'm writing a book and your father and my father were just on the hillside smoking cigarettes. And she, she looked at me, she's actually a, um, a very literary person, a, a French professor at NYU. And she said, you're kidding, you're writing a book. And then I had this moment where I thought, I think I have to tell her that her family isn't gonna necessarily be on the ship. And I said, it's a novel. And so I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know whether the whole families are gonna to get to stay together. And um, 
it was, you know, I left there thinking, oh no, this is like, I'm going to have to just maybe get in trouble again. Um, and in fact, it, I knew that there were, uh, Maurice was no longer alive. I, 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 I was actually still in the, at that point in the novel using Maurice's name because I loved the name so much and it felt like such a great name. Um, the name is not Maurice in the novel, uh, but there were at that point, as far as I could tell from the ship's roster, uh, six, uh, five or six of the passengers uh, maybe seven of the passengers who were still alive, um, including my dad. And um, us. there were actually a couple more, but I, I, five of them lived in New York. And I made the decision not to reach out to them, not to interview them, um, not to find out about their experience, because I knew at least one or two of them um, had figured in my research and I wanted to allow them to become characters. Um, so just to back up and say something about the meeting of Francine in the, in the, in the shop, which was um, some, I was working away the, the novel at that point, what I'd kind of agreed with, with my agent was a very short novel called um, Dear Eleanor Roosevelt. And I kind of imagined it was gonna be 150 pages of just Itzhak's letters, these obsessive letters to Eleanor Roosevelt where he wants to tell his story and kind of confess something to her and also get her help. Um, but somehow working one day, uh, I couldn't let go of this image of meeting Francine. And I wrote that scene. I wrote the scene of it. I flipped it. I flipped it so that, um, uh, the, uh, the the me character um, uh, has no idea about it isn't saying I, I'm writing a book but in fact is approached by somebody who knows things about her father that she doesn't know at all and um, and then and that wound up um, eventually from the first to the second draft of the novel, um, my learning something about the book, which is one of the processes that we all are engaged in, right? Which is um, you think you know the book you're writing and then you learn the book you're writing as you're writing it. Um, so in the first draft, I did my 150 pages. And when I gave it to my agent, I said, look, I gotta tell you, there's like, it's really 180 pages because now there are these 30 pages that are sort of laced through the book of this character named Sarah who, um, who, uh, who seems to um, be learning her father's story. Her father has withheld his story. Um, I think uh, most people who were refugees or um, survivors kind of fall into, this is very broad, um, two camps that I'm gonna say, those who uh, don't speak about their experience at all. Um, I think people of war in general, that's sort of a thing, don't speak about it at all or speak about it quite a bit. Um, so um, anyway, my agent was like, why are you doing that? And then when he read the pages, he was like, okay, good news is I see why you're doing it. Bad news is now you have to write that half of the book. Um, and so once again, while, um, Itzhak's story has some parts of my father, um, but many parts that have nothing to do with my dad's, you know, didn't behave as my dad behaved, his personality is not really my dad's. The character of Sarah, um, who was sort of born out of that meeting in the, um, in the, in the chair store, um, is not me. Um, uh, she's a woman who's adopting a child. Um, I don't have an adopted child. Uh, she, knows nothing of her father's story. It's not like my dad was someone who spoke a lot about it, but I knew things. Um, and so again, I was playing with this question of what's true and what's not true, um, which is also the nature of that book, which is how do we, do we have to know our family's stories, the things that are withheld, the secrets inside of a family in order um, to really know ourselves and is sometimes allowing things to remain in secrecy, a kind of ultimate act of love, sort of parts of the questions inside of that book.
I hope this is making sense. I can't really see people's faces to, um, to know. So next part. Um, and then, uh, so the, the, the book that Jay is talking about, which is called For Everything, um, uh, is my most recent book. And in that, um, so I had a best friend uh, since I was seven years old. What an incredibly lucky thing. She was my best friend uh, for 45 years. We were in continuous friendship. We had a posse of friends and um, she, over the course of a period of time, um, let's call it a 10 year period of time. It actually was longer. Uh, the last five years of her life, she was in and out of remission with cancer. And uh, finally at a point in her life made the choice um, to stop treatment. And um, after she passed, I had um, the strange experience of not being able either to read or write. I mean, write was one thing, but I, I couldn't even read. Um, and when I sort of came to what I could do was write about our friendship. And so I thought, oh, I'm gonna maybe try to write a book about um, a memoir about a 45 year friendship. Um, and I started trying to write a memoir um, and I quickly understood that I couldn't because uh, there were parts of our story, which means parts of her life that she would not have wanted me to tell. Although she had wanted me all the time when I was writing, she would say, how come you haven't written a novel about us? How come you haven't written a novel about our group of friends? We are so interesting, Victoria. And I'd say, um, well, we are, but uh, we need to have a problem. And we haven't really had problems. She's like, come on, we have our kids. We've got tons of problems. So, um, but her death posed a problem, certainly. And um, I began to think that that was, that the question I wanted to look at was how, was less about, her decision, the choice for her to make that decision, but how does a constellation of people manage the question of people's choices? We do it all the time, right? Our friends, our partners, people make choices to get married, get divorced, um, uh, have babies, not have babies, um, go into cults, and do whatever they do. And we reckon with it and we struggle with it, but a life is a different thing. And I wanted to think about that inside of a novel. Um, so uh, once again, I sort of told my group of friends, I think I'm embarking on this. Um, I told uh, her children, I told uh, her ex-husband. Um, and I also told them that she really wanted me to. So I really had some good ammunition um, and, but it was really not easy because um, initially I thought it was going to be told in two voices. The book expands. It's actually told it's in third person, but it's kind of enters about 18 different consciousnesses by the time the book is completed. Um, because once I started, um, I became interested, not just in this core group of, women friends, but then sort of what inside the book gets called the new friends and the old friends. So the new friends are like friends of the character of the primary characters who's, you know, she's lived in a community with them for 20 years and they're still called the new friends. Um, but then it includes, you know, a larger, larger, larger group, including the hospice nurses. When I first started writing it, I gave some pages of it to uh, one of my close friends. Um, who's among that group of friends and who's a really good reader. And she said to me um, after she read a bunch of pages, so I need to tell you um, a couple of things. And one is that um, every time you are trying to write about any of us, the whole thing gets really flat. And it's because I think you think you have to be nice to us all the time and you only can say good things and you can only let us look like great people all the time. And um, you're scared about stepping on any of our feet. And I realized she was totally right. She said, the book got really interesting when you were in the voice of, the, when you were inside the mind of the hospice nurse, cause you don't know her. So it kind of brought me back to the beginning and let me feel the kind of gestalt of these friendships and just start inventing characters and pulling this and this and this and this so that, you know, a character like Molly, if, if I were to kind of um, 
unpack in if I could unpack all the different people that I think are the composite of Molly, one of the characters, you know, there are probably six or seven people in my life that I've pulled from. Um, even still though, there are things that are actual, that seem quite actual. The number of children that the central character Anna has are the number of children Anna had, partly because I couldn't figure out like, well, I'm gonna leave one kid out if there are only two kids and she has three, you know, I, I came into my own little moral questions. I don't know. Um, I think her children have not read the book yet. Um, they felt like it was too intense. So I think that's probably a lot and maybe open. I'm not coming to a full conclusion. I think I'm giving us all a set of problems. Um, so I think, you know, if I were to line them up, the problems are sort of the larger ethical questions of how you want to bend the big world, actual history, and then um, how you begin to um, pull and feel free and feel freedom inside of the history that comes out of your life and the lives around you. Um, thank you. I, I, I'm going to clap for everybody because I know they feel that way and I can see it in their faces. Everybody do this. So, <laughs> yes, thank you. I mean, that was just stunning. And also it, it so totally addresses uh, so many of the questions that are being unpacked in basically in every workshop this week. Great. Um, and uh, there are some questions coming in, but I'm gonna ask one first. I think there are about 10 years between the border of truth and before everything. By the way, the border of truth is not, not a great title for a novel that has so many elements of a life story in it. Is that true? There are about 10 years between them? Oh, hang on. I, I just, I... I would think I would know. I think Border, Wait, a lot of years. Border Truth came out in 2007, and then uh, this was 2017, 10 years. Yeah. So, so my, um, my question is, the process that you describe of taking the elements from a life and then letting the fiction grow within it, um, did you feel that over the 10 year period from one of those books to another, you became sort of more familiar with what that process would look like for you or was it a total new discovery doing it again? Kind of total new discovery is my, as well. Um, although once, once I, In between, I wrote a story collection, which was wildly, you know, it's in the voices of men and women um, and a book of poems. But when I came to Before Everything, um, it took a while for me to see that I was sort of doing something similar, partly because I felt, um, I felt so much at stake in Before Everything in a, a, from the get-go, right? I was really managing I was really sort of, in some ways, writing through grief, um, but also writing, trying to have fun, trying to celebrate the lives of people. You know, the you know the the book is funny in a lot of parts um, of it. So it took a while. Um, the the harder part in before everything was in 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 the border of truth. I didn't know any of the people except my dad, mm -hmm. right? Um, my grandmother had passed away. My, I knew my grandfather, but I didn't know him as a young man. But I had these ideas of, of who they were. I had a lot of photographs. I had things like that. And, um, but in Before Everything, I, I had to let, I had to kind of allow myself to pull from whatever I wanted from the lives we'd led and also to invent the lives we led sort of, uh, which I knew would be like the lives we led. Um, and the, and once I got, once I started doing it, it became a blast. <laughs> I mean, I, it, it really, it, it let it, um, 
you know, it was it was hard because they we were the characters are kind of um, initially holed up in in Anna's house with her, and then I I hit this place where I thought. I, I, I can't have this whole book happen in this house. It's going to be too sad if that happens. That's just bleak. And so I needed to get them out. And so, you know, things were invented, like taking, I, you know, they, the, the women all take Anna off on this kind of madcap spa trip. You know, nothing like that happened. Um, God, all these years I thought it had. I wish it had. <laughs> We've done it. <laughs> I wish we had. Um, here is a question from Joy Abbott. Hey, Joy. How, how much did the real person's voice influence the voice of a character on the page? And did you do a voice mashup too, or did you stay pretty true to their real voices? Um, well, it's in third, it's in a really close third. Um, so. <laughs> In, in a lot of ways, Anna's voice is somewhat like my friend's voice, um, but she's tougher in this book. Um, she's a little tougher. Uh, the character that's the most me. Um, I mean, one of the things I did was invert a lot of things. So uh, the character who's m sort of most me maybe in a way in that book, in this book, uh, takes the position of being completely anti um, the Anna um, going off of medication, stopping treatment. That was not a position that I took. I never took a position like that. Um, and it helped me, um, I mean, that kind of reversal allowed conflict again, right? Because a, a novel needs a problem. And if the best friend is just helpful, well then, that's one less opportunity inside of a novel. So it wasn't fun. Um, in some moments, it wasn't fun to, it, to, to be the character of Helen and be opposing Anna, when in life, that wasn't what we did. That wasn't what happened. So I don't know, Joy, if I'm really answering the question right, um, but I think sometimes the voices are, but again, the characters were such mashups that I got to kind of steal from a lot of different people's voices. Oh, and with my dad's story. Um, uh, the, the, the character of Itzhak, um, uh, as a grown man, he has a different name. He's, he's, he's Americanized his name in the book to Richard. Um, I think, I think he's, uh, I don't, I don't know what my dad was like as a young man, but I think this guy is a little more bon vivant. There's a time, he's, he's, he's wilder. He's, you know, he, um, I don't know that he's so much like my dad. Although I, I had the huge fun of doing a lot of interviews with my dad after the book came out. And, my, and, and people, I remember a radio guy saying to my father, oh, um, Mr. Riddell, you know, Itzhak is quite a randy young man. Um, how were you such uh, and my father kind of got all you know just up in his shirt and you know he said well I don't know if I was quite as randy but you know he just really liked it so he he I, don't, I think he became more like Itzhak I think he fancied himself the Itzhak by the end of it um, I, there's another question here that has come in about your father, but I will also add as a footnote to that, that I remember your father at your book party, which I thought was the most extraordinary thing I'd ever seen in my life that, you know, a, a character would be actually there, would be in existence there being toasted. Um, did you find your father holding back on some information? Was there some sense of reserve? And if so, how did you as an author cope with that mystery? Or did you even indeed know if he was holding back on any information? That's a, it's a great question. Um, the nature of the book is about, the nature of the book has the central character, has the Itzhak slash Richard character 
holding back from his daughter the entire way through. That's that's sort of the central problem in the book is that the daughter, uh, as she goes through this adoption process of a child, becomes kind of the unwitting, um, the reluctant detective of her father's life. And she doesn't want to know, she can't kind of believe that he's, um, that he's gone and has a whole world of people that he's, um, that he's gone and spoken about, um, you know, the war, but he won't talk to her about it. Um, that reluctance, certain, my father had been, um, in my growing up, reluctant to talk with us about a lot of it. I didn't learn about the Kwanzaa part of that he was about to be sent back until um, I was probably in my late teens. Um, and so I think he was reluctant um, in the way that I said that some people just, you know, he, he was trying to move forward. This assimilationist piece of things that I was describing certainly was a piece of our family's life. Um, and so I, I made what I thought was a sort of a slighter reluctance in my dad, a much more central piece of the book. So I kind of, I swerved it more extremely, um, if that makes some sense. But I, th I think the more he spent time talking about it with me, the more he, um, the more memory became accessible to him, the more, you know, wild things that happened, um, you know, the, the bombing of a, of a train, which allowed them to get further than they got, um, all, all sorts of things that I had never known, he began to tell me. And then the way that books have this really cool thing that always happens, you know, um, when you're starting to write. So I decided, um, I wanted, I wanted this boy to be a kid who wanted to get out of Brussels, that he would have seen Brussels as a provincial place and that he'd want to get to Paris. And the, the sign of his wanting a bigger world was the movies. And so I, I, want, I spent a lot of time asking my dad what movies were accessible, you know, and then movies became a big piece of this. And then quite um, remarkably, I learned very early on after I had already decided that, that the actor Marcel Dalio um, who uh, and, and his wife Madeleine LeBeau, um, 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 Dalia, actor, actor, he was in all of Red Moore's films, The Rules of the Game. Um, and then they, they were on the ship and they were among the 86 who were held uh, with my father uh, to be sent back to Europe. So, what a cool thing in your novel to have this actual historical figure. Um, who gets to be on the ship. And I'm not just putting, you know, a famous actor on the ship. He actually was on the ship. So that was a fun piece. That's a convenient truth. Convenient truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned getting into the gestalt of your friendships. Could you give one or two examples? Sure. Um, So um, initially, the, the character of Molly was loosely based on one friend, um, one of my closest friends um, who lives with her wife and their two kids. And um, I started sort of trying to work with that character and it, it wasn't particularly compelling to me as a character. And then um, I, I, I thought that there are elements of her, right? There's a kind of seriousness, there's a kind of um, commitment um, to who she is and, and, um, and, and, and the life she's carved for herself. But there were, there were earlier friendships um, earlier people who hadn't maybe remained as close inside of this group of friends who were really important figures. And um, a friend of ours who uh, had been kind of ridiculously beautiful as a young kind of woman, like sort of, she was the, she was the, um, the 14 year old that you just, nobody's, 
parent couldn't help mention how beautiful she was and the burden that that was on her. And I thought, oh, I want that element to be inside of this novel. Um, and how, how interesting to have someone like that develop into a person who's beautiful, but you know, that there, there's some sort of that age of beauty that was a burden. And another friend of ours who we didn't really know um, the level of, um, of kind of complicated alcoholism that had been in her family. And so that sort of, um, those three things belonging not to the same person. I don't know if I'm really kind of getting at the gestalt, but that's what it feels like to me. Those three elements sort of began to form the, a character, this character of Molly. Thank you. Um, how has your work as a poet influenced your fiction? Totally. Um, I think uh, I'll, I'll do the good and the bad uh, and maybe they're the same thing. Um, so <clears throat> I think I'm so been so lucky as a fiction writer to also be a poet because it means that I spend time and attention on every word. Um, and that seems obvious. It seems like it's our tool um, in whether we're poets or whether we're fiction writers. But I think that sometimes, um, certainly working as a teacher, I find that so frequently fiction writers are so worried about the what's happening, the what, what's going on, that they forget that the what's going on is a made thing that they're shaping sentence by sentence by sentence by sentence, word by word by word. And um, that piece of what it is to be a poet is, is what, is the shaping of a poem in a way. Um, the, so that's the pro. And the con is that I tend towards a, a real, I, 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 I tend towards so compressed, um, like when I'm writing a scene, it tends to be so compressed that frequently I have to like dilate the scene a little bit. You know, like I'll get a scene and then it will seem like, oh, well that's it. And it'll be really like about a, the length of a poem, but, and, and that's fine for certain moments inside of the book, but I, I've also learned that I have to kind of open it and let, and let, let time move in a different way in, inside, of, um, inside of the novel. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Yes, nods, nods all around. Um, just, Shifting slightly to another genre, which we haven't, we have not been talking about, but you happen to have written, in my opinion, one of the great modern love essays, um, which also involves your friend who passed away and had sort of asked you to vicariously go online dating so she could be a part of it. And you then met your now husband that yeah. way. And so I'm curious, um, because we, we have been talking about the arcs of personal essays uh, this week, um, with how in, in shaping an essay, uh, is that different? What kind of a mechanism are you using there that's different from your poetry or your fiction or similar? Well, I tried to write that piece, I sort of, tried writing it a bunch of times, but when I tried it for, for the modern essay, for modern love, they have like a strict word limit. So I knew I was doing something in 1500 words. And, you know, form is a great thing because it, it, it you, you can't do more. You can't go on, you can't have too much diversion. Um, so there I was, I had to kind of aim in and figure out what the piece was, right? I, I, I could spend X amount, you know, I, it wasn't primarily gonna be a piece about, um, it wasn't gonna be a, a primarily a piece about Nancy's dying. Um, it was gonna be about this really, this very, these, this very short period of time, this first very short period of time where I thought I was doing something to kind of entertain her um, and go on dates uh, while she was stuck in a hospital. Um, 
and uh, and then having having uh, met someone on the fifth day. Um, uh, then I, you know, then there was the other piece that was complicated, which was um, actually how can I how can I be happy when someone is not? That was something that I had written about inside the book. It occurs inside the novel as well. Um, the character of Helen has has met someone weirdly, you know, through Anna, but not on it, not on a not on a dating app. She meets a man through a setup that Anna does in, a, in the hospital. So it's kind of invented, but she's wrestling with that sense of what is it to, what is it to have a life that will continue and get better in certain ways when something else is happening. And, and that, was, that, was the, that was a piece of the modern, you know, I, I got to kind of revisit something I had visited and this time as it was. Would, would the you form say is great. Wait, go ahead. The, the, the shortness of the form was great, you know, knowing that I was writing something that only, that had to fit in that. That's helpful, I think. I what was your question, Jay? Um, if you could say something about uh, your literary influences and if they have changed over time, if, if they evolve as you evolve as a writer or if they're formative writers you keep going back to. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, I feel lucky to feel like the world of, of writers I love keeps opening, keeps getting more. Um, you know, I think some people have much, I think I have a much uh, more Catholic sense I, I, of writers I love because it gets bigger and bigger. I sometimes think I'm not as critical as other people, but uh, formative writers. So um, a kind of early poet that I um, loved, I thought was a great big mind of a poet was Adrienne Rich. And she remains, you know, a kind of foundation poet for me. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, who do, fiction wise, I love Flannery O'Connor. I love, um, I love a million people. Virginia Woolf, I love um, Grace Paley's work so much. Um, Poets, I love that whole generation that Adrian is part of, you know, whether it's Phil Levine and I mean, they're the generation that I was schooled on of contemporary poets. So, you know, Denise Levertov, um, Galway Cannell, Phil Levine, um, even a, a little bit later, uh, C.K. Williams. Um, uh, I had the great good fortune of studying with Joseph Brodsky. He was, you know, a great influence as a mind to me. Um, Robert Frost, um, he sort of led me deeply into Robert Frost and Robert Frost is a really important poet to me. Um, Chris Merrill here also studied with Brodsky, I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thumbs up, he's giving you. Yep. Um, there, there's um, one more question that's asking you to restate something. Can you restate how poetry informs your fiction writing in terms of a sense of time? Um, yeah. Uh, in, a, in a poem, well, in a poem, the leaps in time you can make you can make really big leaps in time inside of a poem, right? Um, I mean, a poem can be anecdotal and move just inside of a small moment, uh, kind of like a scene does. Um, but inside of a novel, you have to, there are moments you need to slow down enough to let people be in a room with each other. People, you know, silence happen, things to get misunderstood between each other. Um, things not said, things said, whereas the poem is kind of operating, I mean, it operates in the world, but it's, um, but it's also sort of operating in an interiority that's different. Whereas the novel, um, whether it's a novel that spans a day or a novel that spans multiple years, before everything goes back and forth, it zigzags through time all the way. Uh, um, 
between uh, when the girls first are, are, are little girls together till when they're women in their 50s. So, and, and, and it doesn't move linearly through time. Um, so I had to kind of, I, well, I could, I guess, have, if I was capable of it, I could have zigzagged like that through time within sentences, but I did it sort of in chunks of time. And, and I had to let, I felt I had to let sometimes those moments slow down enough so that the reader could be with me, right? I couldn't go running in and out of different periods of time. I think one of the things when we're, when we're writing, we're, we're kind of guiding our readers through the story and saying, come with me. You can move in time, I'm gonna move around, but I'm never gonna make you totally baffled. Or if I baffle you, I promise I'll come get you. The baffling is part of this. So time has to, time has to sometimes give the reader a chance to stay with you enough to, to, to know what's happening. I hope that made some sense. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I, I think that was beautifully put, as a matter of fact. So thank you so much for coming yeah. to see us. I know we're all going to be talking about this for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Really, it's been very inspiring. Thanks. I next time in Santos, I'm coming, man. <laughs> well, okay, all right. Well, you're on. You're on. We're good for it. Margarita's on me. Cool. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your week. You lucky ducks to get to work together. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Bye. Thank you, Jay. And uh, thank you all for um, joining us for this great session. And we shall see you at the workshop tomorrow. And tomorrow, do we not have the first night of open mics? Yes, the memoir readers, writers are reading tomorrow night. And um, then it'll be the rest of you all the next night. Um, and uh, everybody's got the three minute time limit. And so we'll see you all tomorrow. Buenas noches. Thank you. Bye, Victoria. Thank Bye -bye. you, ZJ Jake. Thank you.